Hello and welcome to our small chat. Uh, as you know, we are showing uh, Baumbacher syndrome uh, in uh, Istanbul uh, with the for our online screenings. And uh, thanks, uh, Gregory, Richard, and Elit uh, to talk a little bit about the movie and about you also, of course. So first of all, how are you? So uh, Greg is in Hamburg, Elit is in Istanbul, and Richard is in Paris. So it's very international. So uh, how are you, Greg and Richard, uh, especially because we know what's going on in Istanbul, but <laughs> how is Hamburg and Paris? Well, I actually just came um, to Hamburg yesterday. Uh, I've been in Spain for three months. Uh, uh, basically on on lockdown and i couldn't couldn't get back to Germany for a while and then um, I just uh, now was the time where I had to come back um, but so i 've been in Spain and to be honest, after I think the first month of coronavirus i i I had an overload of information and media, and I kind of shut myself off and I tried to stay um, productive during that time so when it comes to the corona kind of discussion, how things are going and the politics of it, I, I, I um, actually don't, I haven't been contributing that much in that discussion um, so far. But here things are, in Germany, things are slowly getting back to normal, like the streets are packed uh, and there are some regulations uh, with, with the masks and so on, but, but everything seems to be open and, and going back to normal. Um, I hope that everyone does it in a, in a responsible way, but yeah, that's what it's like here. What about Paris? Well, uh, I was lucky enough to spend all my confinement in Germany where there was no lockdown other than the economy that was closed and supermarkets and, and pharmacies were open. People were allowed to go uh, out as much as they wanted. So I turned, like you, off from the media after a couple of weeks and just tried to turn this thing into a personal um, positive retreat, which I managed very well. So I read Tolstoy and uh, James Joyce and, and, and Proust and, and Thomas Mann and all those big books normally you're afraid of. I read a lot, I, I, I wrote a lot, I meditated, I yoga, and I basically it was all the time in the woods, so it was a perfect time for me. And now I was coming back to Paris for some business, and, and it's true that the situation here in France is a little bit different, They're a little bit more, I would say, traumatized, you know, because it was a little bit policing, you know. People were giving fines if the would be found more than 500 meters further away from their homes mm. and you need papers to go out and then was very weird you know uh, and they are not as well prepared you know they they have basically dismantled their their public health system and that's basically what all in europe in european countries who managed not well the situation were those who dismantled the public health system it was basically italy it was france it was was was was mainly uh, Britain, uh, England, but also Spain. So, and and Germany did not did not do that to this extent. So they were better prepared. I mean, better prepared. They just had the intensive care beds in, in, in big numbers, so they, they could face the situation. In period. So, but now it's going not to normal. I think normal will be a word we can use once we have found. Uh, vaccine or, or yeah. have found something, there is kind of an um, apprehension. People go out again, but say, oh, oh, oh, is it okay if I, <laughs> is it, it's like when people meet, is it okay if I hug you? No, not. If you, mm. <laughs> do you give our hands? No. So the, the, the, the, the, the elbow, uh, hi. So it's yeah. strange. But it's an that, awkward, awkward time. Yeah. Awkward it's time. an awkward time, but it's nice that we can go out again and socialize in, in a normal way. So, yeah. so I was one of the lucky ones, yeah. So, uh, Greg, this is your third feature, no? Yes, uh, third feature, the second uh, feature that I also wrote. So my second film was a, was a German production where I was, uh, just came on board as a director. Um, so I kind of just. see this as my, as my own second film, but um, yeah. Okay, yeah, because I saw it on IMDb that it was the same year, the first two films. Yeah, was like, hmm, that was a, yeah, it's, it's actually because my very first film, um, 
it took us a while to release it. So it came out um, in the same year. Yeah, that was a bit of a crazy year because uh, one thing happened after the other. And uh, I was very lucky, of course, at the time to, uh, it was a fantastic start into the film industry for, uh, for me, but uh, yeah. And then at that moment I thought, oh my God, it must be really easy to make films because there was one after the other. And then afterwards I realized that it takes a long time and it's hard work always. And you get rejected most of the time for everything. But uh, I had a very lucky year in 2016. Okay. Yeah. So, so you write ba Baumbar syndrome also. So yeah. where, where did the idea came from of this guy who has this, like, uh, let's say magical monstrous kind mm -hmm. of voice? Um, yeah, the idea came, um, I was watching uh, the Beauty and the Beast remake, um, uh, the one with Emma Watson and that kind of Disney uh, remake uh, in the cinema. And uh, I'm a big fan of Disney. I've always, I always have been. And um, when I was watching the, the Beauty and the Beast, I walked out of, the, I, during the film, I was loving the voice of the Beast so much. I thought it was, uh, it was like, it had everything in it. It was like scary, but also kind of, soft and beautiful and also funny in a lot of the moments and uh, while i was watching the film i stopped focusing on the film and in my mind i was thinking um of doing something with the voice um so when i came out of the cinema i called my my producer um who i work with on everything um and i called her and said can we do something uh, about a, a person who wakes up with the voice of a beast um, one morning and she thought I was joking at the beginning because it sounds a little odd but um, but then she realized very soon that it was serious and then I kind of took that general idea which was just that basic idea um, I just took that and uh, and then I thought about what what is something the kind of story that I want to tell um, in this particular time and um, it was during during that time where there was um, a lot of hostility in the me in the media um, and and kind of odd characters and uh, like uh, like people like Donald Trump in the media. The Me Too movement was was coming out during that time quite strongly, and I was I was questioning a lot morality of of, of people and and and I was also questioning myself and my actions and my life and thinking. And so it became very clear that I wanted to make a story about someone who. Um, who, who, because of a change in his life, has to reflect on his own um, character. And I thought that would be quite interesting to connect that to this voice. Um, almost, in a way, a very traditional kind of Disney, uh, Disney sense, you know, where in the Disney film it also has like quite a clear, simple message and direction. Um, so we, we, I wanted to, from the beginning, make it like a, like a modern fairy tale um, which has this quite simple story, but um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Richard, you, you are familiar to Beauty and the Beast because you played in the French version. I yeah. Think. <laughs> the Vincent so Cassel and uh, I guess, the Les Cidou version, yes. But how even if you... I wouldn't have, I am very uh, acquainted with the Beauty and the Beast. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, have, I have two daughters, so... I pretty much consumed all what this, all what Walt Disney and Pixar can give us uh, parents to entertain by film uh, our our, our <laughs> big ones. Yeah. And how how did you get involved in the in the project? How did uh, you my, meet? My, uh, I, I actually do not know whether uh, Gregory. I think Gregory was was was. We have the same agent, Gregory and I. And mm -hmm. Matthias was uh, saying to me, hey, Richard, look at this young director. He's very talented. Read it. And I think uh, Matthias made the proposition to, to Gregory and he was looking into it and uh, I was looking into it. And we kind of both uh, uh, agreed that it's a nice idea to work together. So for me, the, the, the discover I think, you know, when you're in the business for a while, then you don't look, normally when you start in this business, you look up to people who are stronger, bigger, more famous than you, so that you can get inspired by the work. But when you are a bit longer in the business, then it's not about age and, and rewards and, and, and whatever, uh, or, or experience. It's just about, the, the, is it sexy, the project, or is it not? And you, you give a shit whether, uh, how old the guy is, or if it's, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, you, it's all about meeting people, interesting people, and telling interesting stories. 
And I personally love very much the story because at what the basic, as Gregory said, it's a very simple story, like a metaphorical fairy tale, modern fairy tale. What I like particularly about it, it was a kind of very daring project. You need balls to, to, to tell a story like that. And what I like, loved particularly was that it, this redemption story is not as told as, as normally it is. Normally you have, uh, you know, you have a, a guy who is a, sh or a person who is a shitty person, something ha bad happens to her, goes to or her, him, he goes through a redemption story and he alters his, his consciousness and after he becomes a better person. But all the others are sh stay shitty. And in this particular case, it's kind of a redemption story where, uh, of course, there is good and bad, but every single character has kind of a little redemption story, you know? There is, uh, uh, I love how, how the relationship with the journalist, there's a journalist in, you know? They're all, they're, they're kind of all have their kind of coming out uh, in, in a certain way. So it's just not a, a bad guy turns into a good guy because something really profound happens to him. It shakes all those who are in the periphery around this, this main character who, who played by Tobias Moretti. And then the other thing was, of course, that if, if, if Gregory uh, is able to convince Tobias Moretti to take on the lead, and I know Tobias because I've worked with him before, he, he's, he's very instinctive. So either he like, he's a little bit like, as I said before, uh, he, he, he, it's not important whether the, the, the, the guy is important who wrote it. It's important that the story appeals to you. And he was just instinctively going into it. So uh, and that's a big compliment to Gregory, you know, uh, as, as, as, as young he, as he is, his writing is convincing to people who are in the business for a long time. So here we and, go. And in, in our June section, we are showing two German films and both of them with Tobias Moretti, mm. by the way. Ah, we are all also screening a Gypsy Queen from Sin Tabak and yours. So, yeah, this is our June month is with uh, Tobias Moretti. <laughs> Tobias. <laughs> but he's, he's Austrian, no? At, at, yes. uh, at, yeah. Okay. Great. So I am sorry a little bit. You will hear Turkish because uh, <laughs> I will ask a question to Elit. Elit'cim, e, bu senin ilk yabancı filmin yani Sibel'i saymayalım. Sibel Türkiye'de geçiyor. Her ne kadar Fransız filmi olsa yine de Türkiye'de evet. geçiyor. İlk defa İngilizce oynadığın bir film değil mi? Ben Hı -hı. birazcık baktım. Şimdi ilk beş vakitle tanıdık evet. seni. Hayat var, Mustang, Put şeylere, Tuzdan kaide, Sibel. Çok iyi gidiyor. Evet. Ve şimdi de bu. Nasıl oldu bu? Yani bu yabancı projeye nasıl dahil oldun? Ve de İngilizce oynamak nasıl bu arada? E, Mustang'den sonra e, Mustang de ortak yapıldı Fransa ile birlikte ve tabi e, uluslararası e, işte baya bir hani e, işte Oscar aday oldu falan filan e, o vesileyle e, Almanya'da e, bir ajansım oldu uluslararası çalışan e, yani benim aslında oyuncu olarak böyle e, hani çok küçüklüğümden beri istediğim bir şeydi e, başka dillerde de oyunculuk yapabilmek hep bu yönde geliştirmeye çalıştım kendimi işte okulda Fransızca öğreniyordum İtalya'ya gittim bir sene İtalya'da yaşadım falan e, 2017 senesindeydi galiba yanlış hatırlamıyorsam ilk e, yabancı dilde oyunculuğu bir İtalyan kısa filmde yaptım e, ve yani gerçekten hani oyuncu olarak hayalim hep işte e, uluslararası projelerde de yer alayım hem Türkiye'de çalışayım ama bir yandan da dünyayı gezeyim e, işte başka kültürden gelen insanlarla tanışayım edeyim falan böyle bir hayalim vardı işte bu e, ajansım aracılığıyla e, Grekler iletişime geçti benimle. E, ben işte ilk başta film e, fikri çok çok beğendim. E, şey böyle bir canavarımsı bir ses vermek ana karaktere ve bu sesle bir e, kendini e, işte tekrardan fark etme bir yolculuğa çıkma hikayesi çok hoşuma gitti. Ee, böyle dahil oldum. Ee, İtalyanca daha önceden oyunculuk yaptığım için birazcık biliyordum açıkçası. Ee, yani ana dilimde oyunculuk yapmaktan farklı olduğunu ve onun da yani çok büyük bir heyecan tabii ki ama e, büyük bir sorumluluk olduğu için de bir stres faktörü de çok yoğun. Peki o farkı nasıl yapıyorsun? Yani şimdi kendi dilinde konuşmadığın için o tam o işte tonlamaları şunları bunları bir şekilde nasıl içinden, içinden çıkıyorsun? 
Yani işte Greg de tabii ki sana yardım ediyordu Hı-hı. yönetim olarak yönetiyor falan ama yine de yani kendini o kadar iyi hissediyor musun İngilizce oynarken de? Yoksa ya gelecek mi o daha? İlk beri İngilizce öğreniyorum. İşte Hı-hı. üniversitede de e, tamamen İngilizceydi. O yüzden e, yani İngilizce konuşurken hani kendimi İngilizce ifade ederken çok rahat hissediyorum. Ama tabii ki e, şey stresi vardı yani hani e, aksanım belli oluyor mudan ziyade aksanım bazı kelimelerin, cümlelerin anlaşılma zorluğu yaratıyor mu diye bir endişem vardı. Ee, ama şey üzerinden çok fazla konuştuk aslında. Yani e, diyalogların alt metinleri ve işte karakterin geçmişi üzerine çok fazla konuştuk. Ve ezberi de yaptığımda aslında hani çok e, yani dil nasıl duyuluyor konusunu çok da fazla aslında umursamamaya başladım. Ama tabii ki de yani başka bir dil söz konusu olduğu için o önceki çalışma e, sürecimiz çok önemliydi. E, Skype üzerinden çalışıyorduk. Böyle bir 3-4 defa falan e, işte konuştuk saatlerce. Orada kendi işte problemimiz oldu falan. Öyle yani çok keyifliydi. Bir yandan stresli bir süreç tabii ki de. E, bir de hiç e, yüz yüze tanışmadık e, yani sete gidene kadar. Ama karşı tarafın e, yani bana verdiği güven bir özveri de sağlıyor tabii ki de. Özgüven de sağlıyor. E, bir de işte e, küçük bir ekiptik, e, genç bir ekiptik falan. E, o da böyle bir e, her şeyi çok rahatlattı. Ve de çok da iyi anlaştık yani bütün ekiple. O yüzden böyle i̇yi çok işte. kabuslu günler, yani kabuslu günler geçirmedim. Ama e, ilk İtalyanca oyunculuk yaptığımda e, yani çok çok e, stresliydim. Onu hiç unutamıyorum. O neydi? İtalyanca oyunculuk ne? E, o bir kısa filmdi. Solstice Inverno diye bir e, daha önce bir festivalde çalıştığım yönetmenin kısa filmiydi. E, öyle şimdi umarım tekrar gelecekte çalışırız. Öyle bir planlarımız var. E, I, <gülüyor> I, was, I was asking a little about uh, playing in English, not your hmm. own language. But uh, Richard, do you speak lots of languages, I think, you know, because you played in yeah. lots of different countries movies, so... Uh, I I mean I, I I personally discovered you, which is a big shame, but in the stream very late because I'm a big fan of, It of is the series. Never too late. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but but I mean, you were in Inglorious Bastards. You you you played with uh, Lelouch, Benini, Luc Besson, uh, lots of lots of uh, directors. So uh, how is it to play in lots of different languages? So first of all, you speak German, English, French very well, I think. But what other languages? But mainly the European languages. Mainly. So it's, okay. it's, it's, it's, uh, I'm perfect in Italian and I, I master okay. quite well uh, Spanish. So I'm, I would say a craft bilingual now because on, on theater level, I I'm per- perfectly feel fine on national theater level for France, for Italy and, and, and Germany. And, and you hear my English and, and so, so my Spain is a little bit behind because I use it less because, but it's my first language I learned in school. It's, it's, it's the, the language I actually learned the longest in school. But I, I spent a whole year last year in, in, in Spain because I did a lot of Spanish movies last year. So, you know, it's going round and round and round and round. <laughs> And um, Greg, well, this is your, let's say, your second feature. But you were, you were uh, like uh, directing actors like Richard Samuel and Tobias Moretti, like big names. So, how was it for you? Is it intimidating or it's? It's um, um, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, it is. Um, but I was very lucky. Um, I guess when, when, when you're young a young director and you cast um these uh am i allowed to say older Richard? <laughs> yeah, of course but i am older <laughs> older older I'm more, more experienced let's father. call it experience let's call it experience actors <laughs> um it's it's uh, of course it's it's um it's always it's definitely intimidating because um you want to and you hear of, of everything that they've done and all the people that they've worked with um you want to uh kind of live up to that uh, especially the first day is always the, the toughest day of course and and we also had our first day was a day where all the actors were together i think that was the only day where all actors actually well most of them um, are together 
And um, that's always the toughest day because you have to kind of see how everybody feels and, and how, they, how they work. And, um, but once you get through the first day, um, it's, it's, it's, um, then, then it, it felt really smooth. And I think I've, I was lucky because all, both of them, uh, Tobias and Richard, uh, just I never got the feeling that they were looking down at me like I'm the young kind of inexperienced director. But, um, and I guess that's, uh, Richard explained it really, really well before that um, it shouldn't be about that, of course. It shouldn't be about age. It should be, um, uh, it should be about what, what, what we're doing, what we're making. And, um, and of course, it doesn't also help for uh, a, any young director needs as much as encouragement and support as possible. And um, I definitely got that from, from everybody involved this time. Uh, the same with my, with my last film, my, my second uh, film, the German film, uh, the one I directed was also starred a very famous German actor. He was, he's already 82. Um, he's a, like a German legend. And, and that was a similar experience where I think I was 23 um, at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he really, it was never an issue at all for both of us. And um, quite the opposite, actually. I find that it's, I almost feel like um, it's, it's an exciting thing for both sides to collaborate for, for the young and, and, and the, <laughs> the experienced. Um, yeah, and um, that's that, that to me. And of course, what I what I realized, what I think when I was in film school, I, I was um, very focused always on the on the technical aspects aspects of film and the tech, the visual side of things. And I, I think that changed completely for me when I made my first film, my my debut in uh, two thousand fourteen, um, because that was the first time I ever worked with actors, and I. Uh, it made this. Uh, it gave me this this new way of thinking on realizing that just the working with the actors is the most interesting, the most exciting, um, and the most important part of every film. Um, and and that is something which I'm, which I appreciate with every everything that I do is is the work with the actors and the collaborations with the actors, which is the most special part of filmmaking. Um, and that's something I. It took me a while to to to kind of, uh, to, to see that this is actually, this is, that's it. This is the best thing about filmmaking. And then to, to be able to work with these great people who've, who've already had this career, um, is, is, I feel, I, I'm just super lucky, of course. Great. Uh, so in the movie, Tobias Moretti's son is playing really, uh, Max's son. Yes. So how, how, how did it uh, happen, this thing? You wanted it since the beginning or it's just... Uh, it, it, it, was a, it, it was a lucky uh, coincidence. It was, um, we basically, we, we cast uh, Tobias um, in the role and um, I was then supposed, uh, I was already planning because I was doing a trip with two friends in, uh, to go to Italy for a, for a vacation. And um, uh, Tobias wanted to meet, uh, wanted to meet me uh, face to face um, to, so that we can kind of talk about the role and so on. And um, so I was on that trip already going to, to Italy and then his agent, and then we, we kind of said just before we go to Italy, I can go to Austria and say hi um, at, his, at, his, at his house. And on the way, his uh, agent called me and said, by the way, have you cast the, the, the son yet? And uh, I said, no, we're looking right now. And do and you have ideas? And then she said, well, Tobias has, has a son and he's exactly that age and he's an aspiring actor. And he's never done, he's never done anything before. So he's never, this is his first appearance in, in film. Ah, um, okay. And, and so for me, it was a very scary moment because I hated the idea of going to see Tobias and meeting him and then meeting his son, because I said to her, yeah, sure, let's, um, I, I can meet him. I'm on my way there now and we'll see. And then we can maybe do a scene together. And I was just going there. I was so scared that he would be, that he would suck as an actor. Um, <laughs> and that I would have to explain to Tobias, yeah, I don't think your son is very good, but, uh, <laughs> but let's forget about him. We'll find someone else. Um, but then I was very, very uh, surprised when we, uh, when I arrived and we, sat down and we had dinner together and afterwards the three of us went into a separate room and just played uh, one of these scenes together and in that moment it was like a like an eye-opening thing where i realized this is like I, I haven't seen that before in film where the father and the son actually play exactly that relationship um and i thought it was just uh it fit perfectly his his 
attitude and his way, the way he is fit perfectly to the character. And, and they also look completely alike. Um, and all of that um, was, was just, I, I, I left and I said, uh, I said immediately, let's do it. And uh, it felt great. And, um, and they did it perfectly together. I mean, you can also think it's tough for the son to work with his famous uh, father in his first ever film and uh, quite emotional father-son scenes and moments, but they were both uh, extremely professional and um, yeah, they were blowing, like he was surprising all of us. I think also Elliot and I had some conversations during the shoot and just thinking uh, this guy, um, he's in the right business and uh, he should carry on. And um, yeah, he's gonna go a long way, I think. Is, is the film released in Germany yet? Or uh, it will come? No, it will. It will still come. It was supposed to um, come to theaters uh, like in uh, March, April, but then we know what happened. Uh, so now we're kind of re-evaluating -re what to do, how to do go with the situation and, and see how things go. Okay. So it won uh, snow dance. Mm. I know sun dance, but what is snow dance? <laughs> it, it's, it's in Germany now. <laughs> <laughs> they did yeah. it on purpose with the title of the festival or what? I, I think so. It's, um, so um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny because my first, uh, my first film, uh, Dusky Paradise, my debut was uh, nominated at Rain Dance in London. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sound Rain, okay. And now my, my second film uh, was at Snow Dance and I, so I'm, the only logical conclusion is yes, that the next course. one of is going course. straight straight to Sundance, of course. Of course. Uh, well, uh, let's hope. But um, no, Snowdance is a very, um, a really cool um, new uh, festival. I think it's six years old or seven years old in Germany, and um, it's. I think it's growing in popularity like every year, and it's it's very focused on independent cinema. So uh, they focus on also on lower budget productions uh, and and so on. And uh, yeah, that was that was great. Um, we had a great time there, and then we we won, which which made us very happy. And, uh, <laughs> so Richard, you do also theater, I think, no? Yes. Yes. So what are your like new projects to come in theater or in cinema? If you have, oh, I was very prolific. I had oh. uh, the most prolific year last year. So. Which is uh, good because this year won't be that prolific, maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm actually in theatre rehearsals right now and we're picking up uh, a project, as I told you in the beginning, hmm. that is to, to, to, to be uh, shown uh, on uh, internet. It's a theatre piece. We had a big success in, in, in, in Paris uh, with it two years ago and we'll pick it up to, to do a version that's a coronavirus version with social distancing and we film it and the direct filming goes directly on streaming on internet. It's going to be released on YouTube and some other streaming devices. So that's one thing. What and in terms the play? of the play is called the ball, the ball, mm -hmm. the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's uh, very uh, freely inspired from Etero Scola, okay, uh, the ball. Yeah. So it's a very collective thing. And, and, and the, the particularity of it is that it is a thing that's definitely, even on stage, it was between the magic of cinema and the reality of theater. So you see how a movie is done and you see the result of the movie on the big screen, but the, the shooting is done in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. So you see all the technicians. So you, it's kind of distanciation, brush, brush distanciation. But at the same time, you see the magic because you don't see all the technicians. You see the, the, the, the final result. And that's, that's playing around these two different levels, you know. And it's happening in front of your eyes. So, so it's kind of really magic. So in terms of projects, uh, it was just released a couple of days ago. Uh, I was part of a, a very nice uh, psycho thriller in the Antarctic ice. It's called The Head. It's an HBO uh, uh, production, mm -hmm. and uh, it's um, hitting high, uh, actually, it's specifically in, in, in Asia. It's kind of the 10 Negroes uh, in, in, in the big eyes and on a, on a, on a station, and they, they, one is killed, and then we are fi trying to find... It's an Agatha Christie modern version of Psycho and the Thing, you know? Besides, okay. there is no... 
there is no extraterrestrial or, or monster thing going on, you know. And the other is is um, uh, is a Finnish uh, Spanish product. It's called Peacemaker. I just saw the trailer yesterday, and it's looking really great. It's kind of a house of cards uh, on a very high diplomatic level. It's called Peacemaker it's because well, I'm the Secretary General from the United Nations, and I bring my team in into warmongering, real existing conflicts, by the way, uh, and and and uh, t uh, trying to make deals so that uh, the, the killing could stop. And for this first season, we are concentrating on the Kurdish-Turkish conflict, mm. which is kind of really the thing that's happening in the Middle East and which brings in Syria and Iraq and Iran, and it, it's kind of a very complicated situation, you know. And then I was doing... Um, also, but just one episode, I was part of the uh, Netflix Maradona series, which is going, which we shot, which we finished. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I played the, the, the, the, the coach of the FC Barcelona, Udo Latek, when Maradona arrived in Barcelona and they didn't get on very well, you know. So that was fine. And I did three movies in, in, in, in, in, in Germany. There is a Netflix series called the uh, Letzte Wort with with Anna Engelke, which is she's kind of famous, very funny, very energetic woman. Yeah. It's she's, a the bit one, she's the one who is presenting Berlinale, no? Yes, yes, yes. yes, uh, yes that's how I know her. <laughs> okay. It's kind of the German version of Six Feet Under, you know. And then a couple of other movies. And now, actually, I'm I also I'm glad to tell that I have this experience of having a movie closed down because of coronavirus. I was just about to finish um, uh, a historical uh, uh, Scandinavian movie. It's called Margaret, Queen of the North, mm -hmm. which we started shooting in, in, in, in, when was it? We started shooting in March, uh, no, in February, end of February, just okay. after the Berlinale, beginning of March, I guess, uh, in, in Prague. And then it was closed down, shut down because of coronavirus. And the uh, beginning of July, I'm going back there. I have one day left. Uh, to to to to finish the movie under circumstances which are not the same anymore because I have to get tested. It has to be negative. It has, uh, that has not that need to be not older than four days. I have to come into Czechoslovakia four days before shooting. I'm under quarantine for three days. Then I can shoot, and and then they have a hotel specifically only for actors. And we can't eat together, we can't shake hands, blah, it's going to be something, you know. And, <laughs> and then we have this thing, of course, you have love scenes and you have fight scenes. And I don't know how they resolve the thing with, with, with because in, in, in the last day I'm going to shoot, it, it's, it's going to be a fighting scene. So we touch each other. Yeah. You can't fight without touching each other because it's not with pistols or, or, or swords, you know. So, yeah. So a lot of experience <laughs> coming up, and a lot of not, a lot of stuff now. Peacemaker is, is just bought by the states, so it, it's will it will have a big release. It's actually really nice things happening because even if, if I don't work at all this year, a lot of stuff will come out. So I'm yeah, happy for yeah, that. Right. Very well, great. Lots of lots of things are changing now. You know, recently, two days ago, yesterday, they announced that the Oscars will be next year at the end of April. So oh. yeah. yeah. Mm. Instead of February, now they are doing a 24th, 25th of April, I think. Mm. So we will, we, we will adapt. Yeah, yeah. Mm? But why yeah. do they postpone it? Because there's no reason for it. You never know, because they're afraid of the second wave is coming. I don't know. And also, oh, okay. lots of films are not released yet. They have yeah, to release yeah. movies ah, so yeah, that yeah. they have some candidates for Oscar. I think that's why. <laughs> that's also, right. <laughs> <laughs> lots of films that were supposed to go out uh, count time or whatever they just uh, cancelled so I don't know we will see oh, wow. peki Elit'cim sana şimdi şey e, şimdi bu ufak ufak artık açılmaya başlıyor dışarı çıkmaya başlıyoruz da senin var mı böyle projeler yarım kalan veya da yeni gelecek olan ee, ben Ekim ayından beri Hamburg'da yaşıyorum aslında. Hmm. Orada e, film master'ına başladım Hamburg Sanat Üniversitesi'nde. E, bu Mart'ta İstanbul'a geldiğimde de e, yazmaya başladığım bir kısa film senaryosu vardı. E, onun için işte... Yöneteceğim böyle... diyorsun yani artık. <gülüyor> Çok güzel. 
<gülüyor> i̇şte onun için bir teaser çekmeyi planlıyorduk ama tabii onlar e, iptal oldu. E, sonra işte benim dönüşüm e, Almanya'ya. İşte ben de Almanca öğrenmeye başladım orada. E, bir yandan oradaki ajansımla işte uluslararası yapımlar için auditionlar yapmaya devam ediyorum. E, Greg bu karantina sürecinde bir e, kısa e, bir yeni bir uzun metraj film yazmaya başladı. Böyle işte onu... she's, not, she's not saying bad things, Greg. Don't worry. Yeah. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> I'm talking about how uh, you've been productive during the quarantine. <gülüyor> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <gülüyor> e, o senaryo ile ilgili işte beraber çalışıyoruz. E, bu Eylül ayında çekilmesi planlanan bir uzun metraj film var Türkiye'de. O maalesef ertelendi. İşte böyle hmm. e, yani ertelenmelerle geçiyor birazcık. Evet. Ama yine de Hani e, okul devam ediyor. Online derslere katılıyorum. İşte. Kendim işte bir şeyler yazmaya çalışıyorum. E, büyük ihtimalle Almanya'da işte e, döndüğümde e, bir 15 gün evde karantina yapmak zorunda kalacağım. E, o dönemde herhalde daha fazla uğraşabilirim bu yazma konusuyla falan. Okay. E, Türkiye'de yani yakın zamanda bir şey çekebileceğimi zannetmiyorum açıkçası. Orada belki önümüzdeki sene e, okul için bir şeyler yaparım. İşte böyle. Ben de biraz e, yani istediğim bir şey zaten kameranın arkasında geçmek. <gülüyor> Şimdi birazcık daha cesaret edebiliyorum yavaş yavaş. İyi bakalım. İnşallah her şey yoluna evet. girer. So Greg, the same question I was asking. Uh, is there some new projects coming? Um, yes. Uh, we are ah. working and fighting on it. Uh, for Edith, Edith said that the, uh, talked about the short film by the way a bit. Mm-hmm. No, the yeah. feature film. The one the, the, that- The feature film, sorry. Uh, the one that you wrote during the quarantine that we're working on the script together. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote something, something new that that I'm actually quite excited about. It's it's it's uh, kind of came out of my isolation in uh, quarantine. Uh, it's uh, this. It's it's it's like a futuristic story uh, with some sci- science fiction elements also, uh, which is something I've uh, didn't think that I would uh, g- go into. Uh, But that that's something that excites me. It's something new. Um, but it, that's going to be. I'm going to take my time with it because I, I really believe in the story and and we want to get the script right and um, um, also um, uh, involving uh, Elite uh, in, and we're trying to uh, just build this project together. Um, and uh, I think it can be a very special story. But uh, we'll see how how things develop. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, apart from that. Um, always different projects at uh, different stages in development. There's some uh, projects which we've already been working on and developing for three or four years, which, um, which are now slowly, um, slowly getting to the point where, where we might move forward with them. Uh, it's, it's always a struggle. It's a long, uh, hard fight, but, um, But yeah, but things are looking looking good. I, I was also for me the quarantine, similarly to you, uh, Richard, was was good because I was. Uh, it was good to take a step back and look at all the projects that you're developing and working on, and uh, to see where you want to focus in what way, and uh, to also take the time and not feel pressured too much um, uh, to to to um, to see what what you want to focus on. And um, and yeah, it was a productive productive time. Okay. Um, what what what is the poster behind you? Because I am trying to see which film is this, and I don't. That's, is it, that's one, is of, it that's one of my. No, no, no, it's not. This is why because I looked. It's not Godfather. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite films. It's um uh, it's Diner. Uh, it's from 1982, I think. Um, uh, it's a debut by um um by Barry Levinson. And it's all the, you know, it has like Kevin Bacon and uh, the other guys, Mickey Rourke, uh, Steve Gutenberg. And this was for all of them kind of like their first film. And afterwards they all became stars. Um, it's an amazing, uh, it's, it's, it's, it's, it was a very different kind of film at the time. It, it's basically a film about just five guys in their 20s who are not accepting that they're growing older. And um, just stay in this kind of boy group and don't want to be released in the world so they stick to each other and they one of them is getting married but he's having problems to kind of make that a reality in his mind that he's actually getting married and it's it's a very funny film and it's what i loved about it is that it's very um very kind of undramatic in a, in a sense and 
Um, and and it's yeah, it's it's very funny. I recommend it. Diner. Yeah. It's actually very very close to what uh, Baumbacher syndrome is about. It has kind of mm. a very undramatizing uh, way of explaining a situation that by normal standards of society would be very dramatic. Mm. And the moment when he retreats into, into the house of his friend, in, into my villa, he basically is cool there. He basically makes a confinement. Yes. He makes his, so the, the, the voice in the Baumbacher syndrome is basically the coronavirus. So he retreats and makes, goes into confinement and once you're in confinement and you're okay with you, which he ends up to be, it's going to be very fine. So the drama comes only from the outside world. The agent who wants absolutely that he meets mm. the, the journalist and the director who absolutely wants to make a movie and the, uh, the journalist absolutely wants to make an interview. But he, oh man, hey man what's, what's the big mess? <laughs> cool down. And it's really interesting that you, you find these parallels, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's always like this when shit happens in your life. It's basically nothing else than, than an invitation into, um, into a reflection on, on your own life so that mm -hmm. you can redeem something or, and redemption is always good for the life ahead. You know? I think that was a, a very important part of coronavirus uh, too for a lot yeah. of people. A lot of people I've spoken to, definitely for myself, uh, it was immediately like within the first two weeks of isolation, uh, just a moment of um, reflection and that you can finally take your time and kind of reevaluate how you've been living in certain ways. And I think for us individually, for all of us, there's been ways, but I think also overall as a, as a world and as, a, as societies, we, I think there have been so much things that also were triggered by it in a positive way that people started thinking, okay, maybe we don't have to live like this. Maybe we don't have to do yeah. this kind of thing in which is, which in the end there's, there can always also be a positive that we can take yeah. of course, from this absolute disaster and catastrophe for on so many yeah. levels, but um, kind of try to, to take, make the most out of the situation and, uh, and, and grow, grow through it. I think we, we yeah. all were given a bit of an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. They, they asked me to put uh, the advantage of the coronavirus into one sentence and I found this one, which I think, for me at least, is exactly what happened. It's coronavirus gave us time back. Time was an enemy in the society we lived in. Yeah. And time has become a friend because I got so much of it. And then at the end, you find out that you never lost time. Yeah. You put yourself onto your shoulders, the pressure of, having, of don't having time. But you have all the time you need. You just need to take it because it's just there in front of you. Yeah. But if you put yourself into a machine that pressures you, then you are the machine that pressures yourself. And that was the magic of that thing because there is no need to survive to make pressure on yourself. You know, we don't live with with with with, with tigers outside the door anymore. I mean, be cool. You know, you can't. It's possible. It's completely possible not to work for a month and without dying. <laughs> you know, I find it interesting how we got there back to there after discussing <laughs> diner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I think we'll finish the conversation. We are talking since fifty minutes. So, okay. okay, cool. Uh, with the we are finishing with the wise words of Richard. Yeah, so, which is very good also. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, taking your time and talk. Thank you, Richard and Elite. And Greg, thanks Elite. for passing your birthday with us today. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I have nothing better, nothing better to do. <laughs> happy, happy birthday to you, Greg. <laughs> happy Enjoy. <birthday>. <laughs>